I love about our church so much is how much we love to celebrate. I love celebrating big moments just like the one we just did. And I also love to personally celebrate too. I love celebrating holidays and I love celebrating birthdays and I love a good celebration. I also have a recently celebrated a big moment in my own personal life. And that is I went to my annual physical uh, this past week. Nothing major, don't worry, don't stress. Uh, but it was a big moment because I realized that I no longer can see in 2020 vision. <laughs> really depressing for me. <laughs> My doctor, I show up and she's like, okay, it's your annual uh, eye exam this year. And I was like, okay, I go in with such pride. My eyes are so good. I've never had any problems with my eyes. And so I get up there and she said, okay, cover one eye. And so I did. And I covered my one eye and I read it with ease and it was perfect and it was great. And I was proud of myself. Then I get up to the other eye and I'm realizing that that eye seems quite fuzzy. And I was like, oh Lord, this has never happened to me before. And so I kind of like start sweating a little bit. And then I go up a line and I can't read that line either. And I'm like, oh no. And I feel myself, I'm like, if you know me, I am your biggest cheerleader in life. I love to cheerlead someone on, you can do it, you got this. And in this moment, I find myself beginning to cheerlead myself. And not only cheerlead myself, I am cheering on my eyes outwardly. Like everyone in the room is listening to me saying, come on eyes. You can do it, eyes. And I'm not being dramatic. Like, this is 100% true. You can ask my doctor. I'm like, come on, eyes. You can do it, eyes. And I can't read that line either. So I go up to the next one. And I'm like struggling through this third line. And it is hysterical. And I'm feeling so defeated, so disappointed in my eyes. And I get into the doctor's office, which I didn't know that she was out in the lobby that whole time I'm having my full meltdown about my eyes. And I said, doctor, I'm 36 years old. How is it that I can't see clearly right now? Why is it that my eyes, they seem so fuzzy? I'm only 36 years old. And she looked at me and said, Lauren, sometimes in life, there's little disappointments. And sometimes it doesn't feel so clear. And it's a little, and she's like preaching to me. And I was like, Oh, tell me more. (laughs) Tell me more, doctor. And I think there's people in this room today that you're saying, I'm 36 years old and I haven't had that kid yet. Why is this so fuzzy? There's other people in this room, you're in your 60s and you've been preparing to retire, but the funds, they don't allow you to retire yet. So you must work another 10 years and you're disappointed. And you're saying, why? Is this so fuzzy? There's other people in the room today. You've been asking God for a miracle. You've been asking God for a breakthrough. You've been asking God for the next season to come. You've been asking God to heal your family. You've been asking God for your kids to come back to Jesus. And you're saying, why is this so fuzzy? And I want to tell you the definition of fuzzy is it's difficult to perceive clearly or understand And even to explain precisely, it's vague. And so often, so many of us have a hard time recognizing how and when God could use your current circumstance. It's fuzzy. It's unclear. You can't understand how we could even possibly use your circumstance. And this is why our faith in Jesus is fuzzy at times. It's difficult to perceive clearly, to be honest, But it's our job as Christians and those who follow Jesus to take steps that are vague and unclear. God is always within or maybe on the other side of you being obedient in the fuzzy faith. And today I want to tell you, it might be fuzzy, but our God, he is faithful. And today... I want to preach to you a sermon called Fuzzy Faith. Can you turn to someone today and say, you're not fuzzy, you're going to be faithful. And we're going to read out the text of Joshua 2. And let me give you a little context of this scripture. 
Moses, who was the leader of Israel, has died. And Joshua, he's now 85 years old and taking the reign. He is about to take Israel into the promised land. But up first, they have to go into the a city of Jericho and conquer the city. And here's how it all happened. I'm gonna read you this scripture. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp of Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of the prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there that night. Throughout Christianity, uh, it has really embarrassed some Bible scholars as to why these spies chose to stay with a prostitute that night. Some have tried to say that Rahab was actually just the innkeeper of the house, but the description as a harlot in Hebrews confirms that Rahab actually, she is a prostitute. And this is really fuzzy. This is fuzzy because there is no real clarity as to why they chose a prostitute's home. Their lives at that time, these spies, they were God's chosen people, the spies. They were, God's, they were going into enemy territory and they felt conflicted. I mean, you're going in and you're scared for your life. You're going to be a spy. And I think what happened was, is that they felt led that Rahab was actually a person of peace and she had peace towards God's people. And what I think is interesting about Rahab's profession is that in her profession as a prostitute, she was really good at hiding men. And it really worked out for the spies in their favor. I know that sounds like stupid and dumb, but I was like, reading the scripture and I'm like, oh man, she's actually really good at hiding men and this could benefit these spies. I know it's hard to believe that the Bible uh, proves in many scriptures that Rahab is one example of someone that Christians should emulate and act like. Can you believe that? The Bible would tell us to emulate and act like Rahab, who we think in our natural eye is a nasty old call girl. But in this story, she's about to go from call girl to called girl. Come on, someone just needs to laugh at that for a second. Rahab in this story, she went from call girl to called girl. And you know what? Honestly, this encourages me so much because I have a fuzzy past. I have a history of not following Jesus. I have a history of making really bad choices. I have a history of living in habitual sin. I have a history of not following Jesus. And just like this call girl, just like Rahab, God chose to use her. And today, when I was 21 years old, I can tell you that I fell to my knees in the middle of my college campus when I graduated college. And God found me in that moment. I was broken. I was living in sin. I was so jacked up. I had made so many horrible choices that the view that I was looking at was nasty and shameful. And he called me in that moment. He said, Lauren, you will either die or I will use you. What are you gonna do? And to stand here before you today feels wild, crazy, and insane. I feel like Rahab on some level. How could God choose to love and to use someone like me? It's fuzzy. It's fuzzy for you and me. But what I love about God is that he chose me. And he's using me. And I'm thankful every day that God chose me. He's given me a ministry. He's given me a family. He's given me an unbelievable community of people. And he's given me a great future. And guess what? No matter how fuzzy you are, even in this moment right now, or what your past has been, if it's fuzzy today, God will take you and he will do that for you too. Amen. 
So let's go back to the story. Joshua 2 says, but someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent back orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come into your house for they have come here to spy out the whole land. Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know they were here where they were from. They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you can probably catch up with them. Actually, she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath bundles of flax she had laid out. So the king's men went and looked for the spies along the road, leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. The culture of that time was to, there was a tradition of protecting your guests. Even considering this, Rahab went to extra measures to make sure that her people were protected. She put her life at risk because honestly, she was committing treason in this moment. She was turning from her community, turning from her country. She was turning in that moment to make sure that these men were cared for. This is fuzzy though. Did she lie when they asked her where the men were? Is this okay to lie? Let's be clear, it's never okay to lie. There's never a righteous lie that is in the Bible. And there is no such thing as being a righteous lie. However, look at Hebrews 13, 31. It says, it was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. It was by fuzzy faith that Rahab was not destroyed. It was by fuzzy faith that she was welcomed. She welcomed the spies. It was by fuzzy faith that she was considered and still to this day is considered a hero of our faith. Some of us today, need to apply the same fuzzy faith to your situations. No one's asking you to lie. No one's asking you to conjure up something that's not true. No one's asking you to do things that might not actually be the case. But what I am asking you today is to be bold at what you see, even in the fuzzy. For us in our church, to be honest, buying this building feels very fuzzy. I mean, we're talking millions of dollars. And Pastor Joey and I, at times before anybody knew that this was happening, we sat at our floor and we said, God, how are you gonna do this? God, do you really wanna use us? These messed up people who are just called by you and who are trying to be obedient. God, is our staff gonna be okay? Can they manage all this? How are you gonna provide the money? Where is it gonna come from? And it's really been super fuzzy for us. If I were an emoji, as since we talk about emojis a lot around here lately, I would be like the uh, the crazy one. What's that? I'd be that one. And then I would be the star eyed girl because I'm like so pumped. (laughs) And then I would be the half throwing up girl. Because that's how I feel in my gut. The crazy, the we're crazy, the oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening, the I think I'm going to throw up. And I bet you in your own life, you have things like that that you feel fuzzy about, that you feel, ah, I'm gonna throw up about, that, oh my gosh, I'm so excited about, that, oh my gosh, I must follow. But when your spirit leaps, you better be bold and fuzzy. Listen, it may be fuzzy, but we know about God is that our God is faithful. And today, if there's something in your life, maybe it's about, you need to go get that business started. This is your moment. You need to go get that business started. Maybe you need to keep believing for your kids that don't know Jesus. You need to intercede on the behalf. I'm begging you to keep praying for your children. Maybe it's that you need to go and pray for that person. 
Maybe God's given you a word and you've been too scared and it's been too fuzzy and maybe you missed it a time before, but I'm imploring you today, come on. It may be fuzzy, but our God is faithful and he wants to use you today right in your fuzziness. Maybe it's that you need to forgive and you need to let go. You've been sitting in this unforgiveness for far too long and it has disabled you from being obedient to God. It's time to forgive and to let go. Maybe it's that you just need to be obedient and give that offering. Maybe it's that you need to start that school. Maybe it's need, you need to change jobs. Maybe it's that you need to start leading. And I'm not just talking about leading in our local church. I'm talking about leading your home and leading your family and leading your friends. And honestly, you just need to be obedient and leading first before God can do anything else with you. I don't know what it is for you, but this is gonna cause you to need some boldness in your life. Let's read number eight. It says, before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up to the roof to talk with them. And she said, I know the Lord has given you this land. We were all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and their family. What I love about this is that so often the Holy Spirit speaks to us and in our heart, we know what to do. And for Rahab, this could have been a moment that she's like not even used to like speaking like this. But I love in her boldness, she says, I know that this is a land that God's given to you. And God, he didn't change her before he used her. Now this does not excuse her behavior because currently she is still a prostitute. But because of this, it helps me see that the love of God isn't a reward for change. The love of God is a resource for you to change. It's the opportunity for you to step into the fullness of what God had. He couldn't leave Rahab the same. He wanted Rahab to be everything she was called to be and to do. And the love of God became the resource in which Rahab could change. This is a picture of what happens when you abandon your old life to follow the Lord. At this moment, she's abandoning and rejecting her past identity as a Canaanite and wanted to be identified with the people of God with Israel. She eventually, this is crazy. She eventually marries a man from the tribe of Judah named Salmon. They had a son named Boaz who married a Moabite woman named Ruth. They had a son named Obed, who had a son named Jesse, who had a son named David. Rahab was a direct ancestor of David, the great king of Israel. And assuming that no generations are left out of the record, she was his great, great grandmother. And as we know it, Jesus Christ, our Lord and savior, he came from the lineage of David. And to get to Jesus, we have to go through Rahab. Can you believe that? We have to go through Rahab to get to Jesus. He chose to use her. God will use anybody for his will to be done on this planet. Are you looking at your fuzzy situation and choosing not to be used by God? Cause no one can do that besides you. No one can choose that besides you. God can be ready and willing, arms wide open. But if you choose to stare at your fuzzy situation and say, I'm out, I can't, I won't, how can he use you? And what I love about Rahab in her messiness, in her, because it's all so fuzzy to us as Christians that he would choose to use someone like Rahab. But to get to Jesus, we got to go through Rahab. Now, the Israelites, um, let me go back actually here really quick. Uh, 
And I want to read 14 to you really quick. It says, we offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety. The men agreed, if you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Before they leave, the men told her, we will be bound by the oath we have taken, if only you follow these instructions. When we come to the land, you must have the scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you let us down. And all your family members, your father, your mother, your brothers and your relatives must be inside the house. If they go out into the street and are killed, it will not be our fault. But if anyone lays a hand on people inside the house, we will accept the responsibility for their death. If you betray us, however, we are not bound by this oath in any way. And she responded, I accept your terms. And she sent them on their way, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window. I'd like to invite the worship team up at this time. And uh, the Israelites at this point, they are going to come back and march around Jericho. When they do, the walls, they'll crumble to the ground and they will destroy every enemy in Jericho. However, the spies promise to protect her and her family, but they give her terms to abide by. Friends, God, he'll always give us terms for being victorious in fuzzy situations. This was a fuzzy situation. But what I love about this moment is that she's got terms to abide by. There's protection in terms. And she was gonna be protected in this moment. The first one is this. It says, leave the rope. And this symbolizes the fact that she's putting this rope out and it's helping her remember that my identity is now changed. I'm no longer a Canaanite. I am now with Israel. I am a chosen person from the Lord. And also what I love about this rope is that she hung that rope without expectation of when they were gonna come and destroy the land. She had no clue. I mean, think about that. She was obedient in throwing the rope. And then maybe like I read, um, I read in some commentaries that maybe even the people in the community were like, what's that rope? Maybe people began to ask her, what's that rope resemble? What's happening there? And I love that this next one, it says, get all the people you love in the house. And yes, that rope was thrown and she identified herself as a new identity in Christ. But when you're making a faith move, you have to tell all the people you love about this faith step this new direction you're headed in. And at that point, they can choose whether they wanna come with you or whether they don't. But this is a moment for her that she says, I'm not going back. So come with me, come to this safe place and give them, and she gave them an opportunity to be safe. And, And what I love about this is that in our church, there are so many beautiful stories of people who their family never knew Jesus. They were never followers of Jesus. But when they were obedient, even in fuzzy faith, not knowing what it would look like, they said yes to Jesus. And then many family members, many people followed along. What's happening with you? Why do you act so different? What are you, what's going on with you? And then they showed up with them and family member after family member, after friend, after relative, they got baptized, they got healed, they got delivered, they got rescued out of sin. And I love that because it's happening right here, but it's also happening right now. Because these people and Rahab chose to choose fuzzy faith. He got to make her royalty. Number three, don't leave the house. This represents the church because the church is a safe haven from the world. It's an embassy of an absolutely collapsing world. This represented the safety of the house they were gonna stay in but it also represents the safety of the house you are sitting in today. And the chaos and the magnitude of which our world is taking us, 
This is the safety for you today with your community, with your friends, with your family. There is safety in being committed to the house of the Lord. And number four, it says, keep the faith. Don't betray the truth. It will be the death of you or the life for you. Keep trusting and believing that God himself will be faithful to you. And today, in the middle of our fuzzy lives, what I know is, is that my God is faithful. I know that for many of your stories, God has been faithful time and time and time and time again. And you cannot turn your back on that. You can't turn your back on the faithfulness of God. And I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what fuzzy situation you're facing, but for me today, to be honest, we got some not so fun news from my mom and my mom uh, has some serious um, clogs in her arteries and will need to have a open heart surgery in the next couple of weeks. And to be honest, like I really wrestled with the Holy Spirit. Are you gonna come through for me? This feels so fuzzy. It feels so unclear. My mom's healthy. How is this happening? Why are you going to heal my mom? Is my mom going to die? I've never asked that question before. Is my mom going to die? This feels awful fuzzy, God. I don't like this. But what I know in my life is that when it's fuzzy, man, my God is faithful. He's been way too kind to me. He's been way too good to me. He's been, he showed up in moments that I didn't deserve him and I didn't even want him, but he showed up every single time. And today we have a God to be thankful for. In the middle of your fuzzy, our God is faithful. He's been faithful to walk you through circumstances. He's been faithful to stand with you when you didn't choose him. And today, in the middle of our fuzziness, we get to choose to be bold in our faith. Today, we get to be choose to be bold in our city. Today, we get to choose to be bold in our walk with Jesus. Today, we get to choose to tell others about Jesus. And just like Rahab, he chose to use her. He can choose to use you today. Would you stand all over this room?